I'm going to just give a bit of background to why we're here. I'm going to give a little introduction which is based on what I think is an incredible lack of professionalism and professional leadership in the built environment in my professional lifetime and it cannot be allowed to continue. For a moment, let's be in the world, but also let's be in Edinburgh. And what will Edinburgh of the future look like? Meet old Leakey, 2164. Norlock is back, where you all arrived at, at Waverley Station. And the grass market is now the water market. And my office at Gayfield Street is now on the waterfront, which is quite select, I think. However, um, in reality, the landscape across Scotland, the UK, and the world is changing. This is the sort of estimate that we talk about for global warming. This is what I looked like when I read that estimate. It's in my Building Biology and Colour, Volume 5, which I've still got, got it in my office. Um, I was a budding physicist and chemist, and it made complete sense to me. Why did I not go on climate strike? Because I thought we were going to solve it. I thought that was the point. I thought that actually we were going to do something about it. We lay them out toy town style in joyless, monofunctional estates, we call them, devoid of richness and located away from essential services like shops, schools, places to hang out. Then we sell them to the highest bidder for the most profit, hoping they won't spot any of the flaws before the period of responsibility has run out. It gets worse. We're just doing it all the wrong way. Uh, we're building less than half the demand in the UK and volume builders will not meet that demand. House builders call the public into buying hugely overpriced rubbish, the architectural equivalent of the Turkey Twizzler. <laughs> if we were in Austria, we wouldn't be having this conference. 84% of all homes built in Austria are built by people acting individually or collectively to build their own homes. That's a population of 90 million and not, not an odd little European country one of the most valuable economies. We see community-led housing and self and custom builders being integral to this mission to, to encourage sustainable design because I've, I've not spoken to a group yet that didn't want to do something that was environmentally sustainable as part of why they didn't want the, the box homes that, uh, that John was talking about earlier. In the course of the research for a book, I came across some fantastic contemporary projects in the UK, and the people that I've invited here today are able to describe some of those. We've got the Bath Street project in Portobello, Springfield um, in Stroud, and Lilac in Leeds. Lilac stands for low impact living um, in homes that are affordable and with a strong community. And I think we've realised all of those things. About 15 years ago, we got involved we're supporting the Spring Hill Co-Housing Group in Stroud, where a group of ordinary people came together to act as their own developers to purchase a piece of land and go through the process of uh, designing a very, very innovative uh, car-free uh, site of uh, highly sustainable timber frame uh, houses. When you talk to people about what they want about houses, most people say we want tall ceilings and we want big windows, we want space and light, so let's build that. We can build sustainably. We use zero fossil fuels, we're extremely well insulated, there's no central heating. Um, all the cooking and water heating is done via electric and that's all done via renewables. And we can innovate in a way that house builders can't. What we've done really is lay down a marker for a very different way of delivering permanently affordable housing through this mutual home ownership model. Um, at a very high level, it's a really big deal because it essentially decommodifies housing. It essentially takes a housing unit out of the commercial market and puts it in the hands of a community developer. And one of the things that I want to focus on as well are the co-benefits that these kind of schemes deliver. Um, and that's across energy, food, housing, transport, water, finance, whichever aspect of life uh, you want to focus on. It's the co-benefits that these schemes will bring, which will hit almost every policy target any municipality will have, in a way that the volume builders almost corrode every single policy target that policymakers want to put on the table. We are the exact opposite. Yeah. So. One of the ways I'm framing this now is that what we're building here is climate emergency communities. I'm very aware that there are not many community good buildings in this area. And I think there is a lot to be said <coughs> for 
starting to look at how to build community. Circular economy houses, resource efficient houses, um, low embodied houses, better performance houses. So wide remit and always looking to, to get out there to the industry. I'm mainly here because of, kind of the frustration of like, developers and their mentality towards house building and the lack of emphasis on community and sustainability. So seeing how we can change that. There's stages in the process, particularly the early stages, where raising money is really difficult to get the idea conceived and, and developed to a point where you can begin to give it legs and to, 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 to present it as a you know, concept that can run. By 2036, an estimated one in three people in Scotland will be over the age of 65. I believe that we're building society's problems into our homes and we're missing exciting opportunities to create diverse and nurturing spaces which genuinely transform lives. I know certain architects have tried this and social landlords are actually the route to how we get better housing because they look after a house long term. It is their asset and it's the iceberg principle. What does it cost to build? What does it cost to run? What does it cost to maintain? And we know that two thirds, three quarters of the cost is a bit below the level. And this procurement legislation, as Gordon has just mentioned, is absolutely the killer of new housing in Scotland. It's designed to be cheap, cheap, cheap. And why aren't the council here? Why aren't the government here listening and enjoying and engaging in this conversation? We just need to be better at understanding why John's organisation wants to lend into the safest place to lend, and that's us acting collectively together. Our mutual model, which attempts to decommodify housing, but like building that economic equality, uh, the economic democracy between our cooperative members. So I, I, that's really important part of the jigsaw for me. But the thing that captures people's imagination is that we've committed to this financial model, which brings it all together. The finance part, um, we were looking at um, the difficulty to start the projects. Um, there's no funding available, often for feasibility study or up to planning or up to, for any business plan and things to be to, to be drawn up in order to apply for building funders. So where do you start? I'm sure we're all sitting in the room going, well, actually, you could have a different financial system. You could have a different assessment system. We can. The building rates can change. Conceivably, all of these things can be done. How we actually produce the groundswell of political opinion to make that happen is the challenge. I think the important thing is what happens from here on. Um, Sandy has said to fill up on the feedback form if you want to be kept in touch. I would suggest maybe it might also be worth saying um, what way, if there was anything that you felt that you particularly wanted to contribute to, any particular interests. So thanks to the speakers and thank you so much, Sandy, for organising it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, syndicate leaders. Thank you, the facilitators of groups. Thank you to the funders and sponsors.